Well, hello everybody. Uh, very nice to see you all at church this afternoon. Um, today we're going to have a Sunday club. Um, we're going to be looking at John chapter 7. Uh, if we could get the next slide there, Ray, uh, where Jesus goes to the festival of tabernacles um, and he, he goes to visit the temple. So um, that's going to be part of what we're thinking about in today's service. There's also Holy Communion. And so you'll be coming back in a little bit later for that. Um, when Jesus goes to the Festival of Tabernacles, he shows that he's not just out for his own glory. Um, and so I've got a little game for us to play today. Um, it's a boasting game, and we have to boast. So whoever thinks that they are pretty good at boasting, here's how the game's going to work. It's going to be competitive. There's going to be two of you, and you have to make up the biggest boast. So somebody might say, I once had dinner with the prime minister. And then the other person will be like, so what? I once had dinner with the prime minister and the queen. <laughs> and then somebody else will be like, so what? I once had dinner, and, and this will go on, until you run out of ideas, and then you just have to say, wow. So if you run out of ideas, you have to say, wow, would anybody like to play the boasting game? Go on, Harry and Benji, up you come, both of you, up you come. Harry and Benji, up you come. So it's a, it's a competitive boasting game. Can we get that one on? So Harry's going to start. I met the President of the United States of America. I met Obama. I met President Zelensky. <laughs> I met the whole Liverpool team. I met the England team. Go bigger than that. I went to America. Oh, that's not bigger than that. <laughs> I met the I met Messi. I met Ronaldo. Oh again, not bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I met Salah. I've got a Lamborghini. <laughs> I've got a Bugatti. I've got a Porsche and a Bugatti. <laughs> I've got a Bugatti, two Ferraris, and three Lamborghinis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, boys. Those were some brilliant boasts. Um, part of the point that Jesus was trying to make when he went to the temple was that um, he was talking about whether or not we're out for our own glory. So it said this, whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, which means they do so to boast. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is the man of truth. There's nothing false about him. So we're going to be thinking a little bit about that as we go through today's service. Whose glory are we out for? Are we looking for our own glory? Are we looking for the glory of God? How do we spend our time and our thoughts and whose glory are we after? So as we begin our service, um, let's just bow our heads in prayer as we thank God for bringing us here, however we've spent our day today. So let's pray. God, we gather here today at the end of another week and maybe we're feeling tired or maybe we're feeling energetic Maybe we're feeling happy or maybe we're feeling sad. God, we pray that whatever we're bringing into today, that through our worship, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would bathe us in your streams of living water, that our lives might seek your glory first, that we would not be boastful, but that we would boast only in you and that we might worship you truly to the praise and honor of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing our first song, which is Celebrate. Um, please do stand in and join in. Thank you. <laughs> praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening. Praise Him when you're smiling, praise Him when you're breaking. 
Praise him in the sun and praise him in the starlight. Praise him every season, praise him through the dark times. children and young people are going to leave us now with Elise um, to go over to Sunday Club. As they leave, let's just maybe take a seat and let's say a prayer together. So God, we thank you that whether our week has been good or bad, that we can join here together to celebrate what you have done for us and that we can join here together to worship you. God, as we hear your word read to us today, would you bless us with that sense of peace that comes from knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so we're going to hear the word of God, I think, now. Um, Liam's going to come forward. Thank you very much. And the reading's just up here uh, on, on the sheet of paper or on the screen there. Thanks very much, Liam. Thank you. Oops. Sorry, I stole the microphone for our boasting game. <laughs> reading is from John chapter 7 verses 1 to 24. After this, Jesus travelled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea, where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters, and Jesus' brothers said to him, leave here, go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, Now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go any time. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me, because I accuse it of doing evil things. You go on. I'm not going to this festival, because my time has not yet come. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. <clears throat> but after his brothers left for the festival, Jesus also went Though, though secretly, staying out of public view. The Jewish leaders tried to find him at the festival and kept asking if anyone had seen him. There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some argued, he's a good man, but others said, he's nothing but a fraud who deceives people. 
but no one had the courage to speak favorably about him in public, for they were afraid of getting into trouble with the Jewish leaders. Then, midway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The people were surprised when they heard him. He does, how does he know so much when he has not been trained? They asked. So Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. But the person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. Moses gave you the law, but but none of you obeys it. In fact, you are trying to kill me. The crowd replied, You're a demon possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. But you work on the Sabbath too. When you obey Moses' law of circumcision, actually, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. For if the correct, ta- the correct time for circumcision, circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so that you can judge correctly. Thank you so much. So if this is your first time with us, we've been uh, going through the book of John uh, from the beginning, and this is now uh, our seventh chapter. As we uh, look at God's word together, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you blessing to us in scripture, that we can read these words and think more about you, that we can read the story and his life and his teachings. So be with us today as we consider this story and teach us from it what you would have us learn. In Jesus' name, amen. So in our story today, um, we hear about the festival of booths which is um, not so well known, a festival, um, but it's still celebrated today. And the point of it is it's reminding the people of their desert living back uh, in the times of Exodus, thousands of years ago. And it's called either the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. Um, It's also meant to be like an agricultural festival, celebrating some of the harvest of grapes and olives in particular. And... What it would have looked like at that time would have been just tens of thousands of people all coming out of the countryside, all descending onto Jerusalem. Um, all kinds of celebrating would have been going on, maybe in the, mainly in the temple, um, but also like just out in the streets um, with like wine pouring out and uh, pe- the priests would have been like marching past the altar uh, carrying citrus fruits and palm branches and just a general festival celebration going on. It was a key hope of the coming of the Messiah. Now, that's what that festival pointed towards. And also the liberation of the people from Rome. So that was a little bit of the context into which this story that we've heard read uh, would have been. Let's, uh, we've got a video of it now in, in modern times, actually. If you could, that's the one. High security measures were taken in Jerusalem during the Feast of Sukkot, which ended on October 5th. Also known as Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot is one of three pilgrimage festivals, festivals that are linked to a pilgrimage. In ancient times, people used to visit the temple in Jerusalem to offer sacrificial gifts. This is a particularly joyful feast. It combines religious themes and agricultural elements. Sukkot originates in the Torah, and it commemorates the booths in which the Israelites lived during their life in the desert after the exodus from Egypt. So they've, they've not stopped doing it. It's still going on even, even to this day. And this year, it's, it's a little bit later on in the year. Um, but I hope that helps to set the scene of what's going on. Enter... Jesus and what's going to happen in this story and this festival they're going along to this festival Jesus' brothers are going along and so a couple of slides on they say to Jesus leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there can see the work you do no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret since you're doing these things show yourself to the world 
And even in this, his own brothers did not believe in him. And so we see in these verses, Jesus' brothers, if we could just nip back to that one. Thanks, Ray. Um, they're like half believing in him. They aren't quite sure who Jesus is, what his point is. He's some kind of wonder worker. He's some kind of extraordinary person. Surely if he's such an amazing wonder worker, then doesn't it make sense to go where all the people are? Go to this big festival and show yourself. Do it there. Don't do it in this sort of backwater Galilee place. Do it in a big, like, exceptional place in Jerusalem. Go there. It's a bit like what Eminem says in his rap masterpiece, Lose Yourself. You've only got one shot. Do not miss the chance to blow. This opportunity only comes once in a lifetime. You got to... And it's stuff there. Um, go and seize your glory, Jesus, is what his brothers are telling them. Go to Jerusalem. Stop hanging around here. Stop this backwater business. Go to the main place. Get your glory. Head down to the festival. Do your thing there. And yet, Jesus doesn't seem to go along with his brothers or with Eminem. Uh, he doesn't seem to be out for his own glory, as we see in the next little bit of our passage. Jesus replies, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going. My time has not yet come. And after he said this, he stayed in Galilee. So Jesus' time, he's saying, will not come in the autumn, which is when this was. The Festival of Booths this year is from the 29th of September to the 6th of October. So it's around about that time of year. And Jesus is saying, this isn't my time to go to Jerusalem yet. My time will come in the spring, which is the time of Passover. If you remember that reading from John's Gospel, um, that week that we were talking about the blood of the lamb being dabbed on the doorposts, um, that will be the time that Jesus will enter Jerusalem. But Jesus' time's not yet here. And so it's like he's saying, it wouldn't be right for me to go to Jerusalem in this pilgrim convoy and healing and building up expectations, it's not yet the right time for me to do that. We see also in this, in this little verse here, in verse 7, the world. Now this is a very common theme in John's gospel in particular, this theme of the world. The Judeans are basically looking for a chance to kill Jesus at this stage. They don't like him healing on the Sabbath. They don't like him putting himself on equal terms with God. And so Jesus is saying, the world hates me. What tragically sad words. I find those really upsetting on a deep level. On one, world, on one level, the world here, it means everything created. It means all of the whole created universe, all the peoples of the earth. But on another level, it's talking about our deep-seated rebellion against God and our deep-seated turning away from God to the extent that the people are actually even trying to kill Jesus, even trying to kill the loving creator. Now, ruling your own life goes back the whole way through the Bible, right back to the very beginning. Um, it's a continual theme, even back from Adam and Eve in the first temple, in the first garden of Eden. They want to rule on their own terms. If any of you were here at the very beginning of the service this morning, uh, we had a reading from there where that the rebellion almost begins there where Adam and Eve take that forbidden fruit that God told them not to. And then throughout the whole of the Old Testament, we see just hopeless corruption, hopelessly corrupt temples, even to the point of Jesus storming into the temple and overturning the tables, if you remember that week in John 2. We are people who still live in times like that, if we're being honest. There's corruption all around us. There's very sad stories all around us. And we wait and hope for something better as Christians, a new temple. We wait and hope that Jesus' presence will come in a new way. And Jesus is making some pretty controversial claims in Scripture. Jesus claims that, see that temple where you're all going there? That's not the true temple. He's claiming, I I'm the true temple. And through me, I will make you into many temples as I give you the Holy Spirit. And so that's what the church is. People who are built in 
to be living stones into the true temple. And one day we hope that all creation will become a true temple, despite our deep-seated desires to rule ourselves, our sin. Here's the problem. Um, Jerusalem, its leaders, even its temple, even the place for this festival of Sukkot, festival of booths, festival of um, tabernacles, even those have turned away from God and shown their sinful desire for independence from God. And so when Jesus is thinking about going to Jerusalem, he's talking about showing himself to the world, but it's a world that's turned away from God. And it's a world that even its religious festivals, even this festival of booths, is a way of turning away from God, the God that they outwardly seek to celebrate. It's a world that doesn't really want to know too much about God's loving purposes because God's purposes are strange. They're hard to understand. And if you've been reading John with us from the beginning as we've been going through this sermon series, you may recall that tragic verse just at the end of last chapter, John 6, verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so when Jesus is thinking about, should I go to this festival or not? That's the type of world that he's talking about walking into. A world that's turned his back on God. God had chosen Israel to be like a representative people, the light of the world, but they've turned away. And so it's almost as if all of the anger, all of the sorrow, all of the evil, all of the rebellion has all been concentrated in Jerusalem. And so when Jesus goes on to Jerusalem, as he will do in just a little bit in this reading, he's not just going into like some local celebration, some local festival. That's not what he's doing. He's going in to face the problems of the whole world, the world that God loved so much, but the world that's turned so out of line, the world that's missed the mark by so much and it doesn't enjoy being told it's out of line either. Um, as it says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. And so the world doesn't enjoy Jesus coming to us to tell us your works are evil. And it cannot yet see Jesus as the one who both diagnoses the seriousness of the problem, but also as the one who provides the enemy. Can't quite see that yet. And so, off Jesus sneaks um, to Jerusalem behind his brothers. Um, despite, he, he said here that his time hasn't come yet. He said, um, I'm not going, uh, you go. Um, I'm not going up to this festival. My time hasn't yet fully come. And yet off he goes. That's a bit strange, isn't it? Um, it's not yet spring. It's not yet the time of Passover. He says, he's, I'm not going up to die on the cross yet. I'm not going to provide the remedy quite yet. But I'm going to sneak I'm going to sneak there behind my brothers and go in secret. And so what does he do, uh, having gone in secret? Um, what, I wonder what you would do if, if you were going along to a festival like that where there's thousands of people dissenting and there's a threat in your life. How would you behave if you snuck there? Well, what Jesus does is he goes right up into the middle of the feast. He goes into the temple and he begins to teach. That's quite a... Quite a, quite a public way of, um, I'm not sure quite how to describe it, but if you're in major danger, how would you avoid life? How would you avoid the danger to your life in a less good way than going and starting to teach? And not only that, he assumes the office of a rabbi in doing so. And it's like all the other rabbis are looking at him and going, are, are you out of your mind? You've come here to teach you haven't got our formal qualifications. You haven't followed the other rabbis. You're just some backwater preacher. I think it might be on the next slide, actually, Ray, if we could pop onto that. The Jews there were amazed, and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? They're basically saying, how dare you? How dare you teach without any of the right qualifications? If we could just go back to the, to the one just before that. How dare you? do that. How did you get such learning without having been taught? You assume our office, you assume to teach us, 
Do you not know what it means to be a rabbi? How dare you? And then Jesus replies on the next slide. My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. It's like he's saying here, if anyone really wants to do God's will, like really wants to, if anybody really seeks God's will, then they will know whether or not Jesus' teachings come from God or whether he's just making it all up to boost his own reputation. The direction of the logic here is, is that, and, and just bear with me for a moment because we're about to see it reversed and wrong. If anybody wants to do God's will, Jesus is saying, verse 17, anyone who wants to do God's will will know, it will become clear to that person that Jesus is from God. The Judeans want to do it the other way around. They come at it the other way around. First, they want to hear Jesus' teaching and to weigh it up and then decide whether or not that's from God or not. And if there's something in Jesus' teaching that they don't like, or if they don't want to do what God's telling them, or if there's something that offends them, then they're going to rule Jesus out of consideration straight away. What a mistake. It's a mistake that we can make in our own lives too, as we weigh up Jesus' teaching. And if we don't like it, if it offends us somehow, we can push it aside a little bit. Some of the hard things that Jesus says to me that sometimes I want to push aside, that I don't want to hear Jesus saying to me, is like how God actually owns everything that I think that I own. And all of my possessions actually are a gift to me by God. I find that really hard because I want them to be mine. I want to hold on to them. And so I can push that teaching aside sometimes and think, no, that's mine. Whereas in reality, Jesus is teaching me that things aren't mine. That's a really hard one. Or another hard teaching, how we sometimes need to put ourselves in uncomfortable positions and speak of our faith to those who might mock us or ridicule us as a result of us, of our faith. How we have to, perhaps when I go to badminton this week, to speak of my faith, not just of my church, not just of the things that I've done that week, but of my God to people who might not think the same way as me. That's a really hard thing to do. It's a hard teaching and one that we can be apt to just putting, along, putting down a little bit in the packing order. And so we have this divided opinion in, of Jesus in our Bible reading where people aren't sure whether he's come from God or not. And we see that in verse 12. If we could have the next slide up, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. No one would say anything about him publicly for fear of the leaders. Now, this is more serious than it might initially seem. Um, if he's a deceiver, as some people are saying in verse 12, then he's a false prophet. And if he's a false prophet, then as far back as Deuteronomy chapter 13, there were penalties for that. The penalties are clear that he should be put to death. So following that religious, religious logic through, then when Jesus told the cripple in John chapter 5 from a couple of weeks ago to pick up his mattress on the Sabbath, that was a telltale seal that he was leading the, the Israelites away from the law, hence away from God. And so what does he deserve? Death. That's the religious logic here. They look at Jesus' teaching, something in it offends them, doesn't conform to the Sabbath well enough. Therefore, by Deuteronomy, by their law, this man deserves to be killed. Thus says religion. Religion has led them to the point where they're ready to kill the Son of God. And so the crucial question really is, is this Jesus really from God's? Their logic has got all backwards. They've looked at the teachings of Jesus, found them offensive, and then decided to kill them. For those who really love God and really seek his truth, 
It should have been evidence that Jesus was from God. And so that's the crucial question. It's the crucial question for us all today too. Is Jesus really from God? Or is he acting just in his own authority? Is he just some strange man with some strange teachings, able to do some amazing miracles it seems? Jesus' answer to this is pretty bald in the next slide in verse 16. My teaching's not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Jesus just clearly answers that in his own words. My teaching's not my own. I am from God. How do we, how do we weigh up that claim? Do we accept that? Do we, do we struggle with that? Do we reject that? Verse 17 expands that with a challenge. Maybe the reason that you can't see that, that Jesus is really from God is that your mind is really close to what God wants to tell you. That's what he's saying in verse 17. If you really wanted to do the will of God, you would find out that I am from God. You will find out whether my teaching comes from God or not. What a profoundly difficult challenge for us today, I think. If we really want God's will, then whatever the cost for us and whatever it might mean for us, whatever persecution we might face as a result, then we will follow Jesus who seeks not his own glory, but God's glory. And how do we see that? How, how can we be sure that Jesus is seeking God's glory and not his own? Well, for me, sacrifice. Why else would he do these things that get him into such trouble and that provoke such threats on his life? Why else would he go to his death? Why wouldn't he behave like his brothers seem to want him to do? To go to this festival and be like, look, follow me. Aren't I great? Give me more glory. He doesn't do that at all. But out of obedient love for his father and out of self-giving love for his people, he gives himself away, to even to death on a cross. People out for their own glory don't act like that. That's not what people out for their own glory do. As the warmongers in our world today show us with the anniversary of the UK and war on Friday past there, People out for their own glory sacrifice other people, not themselves. And we do pray for a quick end to that suffering. People out for their own glory, they, they don't act in obedience to God. They don't give themselves away in love to others. I think it's a little bit like that old question of how do you know the Bible isn't just entirely made up? How do you know that it's not just a bunch of stories that somebody wrote down one day? And I think one of the basic answers, apart from the huge wealth of historical evidence and archaeological evidence to the contrary, is that people simply just don't act this way. People don't act in this way. If you're making up a story, it, it wouldn't be made up like this. Take the disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection. Did they just make that story up for their own glory? Did they really not see a risen Jesus and just think, oh, you know what, we'll just make up this story. Jesus has come back from the dead. Will we just make that up? Well, every single one of them died telling that story. And you don't behave that way if you're making something up. You don't behave that way if you're just out for your own glory. If you're making up stories to promote yourself and promote your religion, promote your thoughts, you don't behave that way. You don't behave in that sacrificial way. People don't die for a lie, and every one of them did. They wouldn't have acted that way if they were out for their own glory. And so this remains the response to those who seek to challenge the Christians on the truth of their message today, I think. Are we just looking to boost our own prestige and wealth in our lives? Are we out for our own glory? It's a tough question, that. Many times people have accused the church of that. That church is just out for its own glory. And sadly, sometimes throughout history, that's been fair. And some churches have acted poorly throughout history. But I think blaming the church can be just quite, a, quite an easy way to avoid the costly call of God. And verse 18 here, it's, it's just as much a challenge to today's world and today's church as it ever was. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. If the church and if we, as parts of the church, are really out to live out the sacrificial love of Jesus for God and for world, 
then it will become clear that we are not seeking our own glory, but the glory of the one who called us and sent us. And so I'm left with a couple of questions for me personally out of that passage and out of that idea. Am I out for God's glory? Or am I really just out for my own glory? And how can I tell? How do I know? How do I see that? Are there ways in my life that I can see that in action? How is it visible in your life too if you would say that you are committed to God's glory? And where in our lives, if it's less visible, do we need to make a change? As I finish, we're going to spend just a little bit of time in quiet, just uh, with those questions, uh, which are just up on the slide there for us. And we'll just sit in quiet for a little moment, give us some time and on whether we're out for God's glory or not. And then... What, what will happen just after that time of quiet is it'll lead us into a confession um, based on Nicodemus' bravery, which comes just a little bit later on in the chapter. And then we'll sit and we'll just listen to a song, Oceans, which you're welcome to join in with if you'd like to. But for now, let's just spend a few moments in quiet, just considering those questions. Am I out for God's glory or for my own? And how can I see that? Is it visible? Where might I need to make a change in my life? Let's just take some time in quiet. And so a little later on in John chapter 9, it says this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. A little later on. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked him, why didn't you bring him in? Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? And so, Lord, we... We thank you for that bravery of Nicodemus that he showed in standing up for you. He thought he was okay with you initially because he lived a religious life and a good life. But Jesus, you told him that that wasn't enough and that he needed to be born again into a relationship with you. And so, Lord, we need that too. God, we offer you those ways in which we've gone wrong when we've been out for our own glory and not for yours. Forgive us, we pray. And give us your rivers of living water, your Holy Spirit, to help us live in a way that seeks your glory first. When we don't know what to do or where to go, help us to trust in you, to be our guide, in your name and for your glory. Amen.
we're going to sit and listen to our next song, Oceans. If you'd like to, do join in. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your call upon our lives. In this Lent, we place our trust in you, in your teachings in the Bible, and in all that you were. We give you thanks for the road that you walked to Jerusalem to be crucified and to die for us. 
that the whole world might be free. Lord, we ask for your help that we might order our lives for your glory. And Lord, that we might speak well of you in everything that we do and say. Gracious God, we ask for your blessing on this church, for all of our congregations, especially for our 1030 congregation and our Thursday congregation. We pray that your joy and love will flow freely in and through us, that as a church we might be faithful to the teachings of Jesus Christ our Lord. And in a moment of quiet we ask you to show us just one area of church life where we might be able to serve for your glory. Creator God, we pray to today for all countries that continue to be torn apart by conflict or hunger or natural disasters, particularly praying for anybody who's lost a loved one or has been forced to leave their homes due to the earthquakes in Turkey and northern Syria or the ongoing war in the Ukraine. In a moment of quiet, we pray for any country that we're particularly concerned about today. Father God, we pray too for our local community. And we ask that each of us will make use of the individual talents that you've provided us with to enable our church group to flourish as a witness to you so that we can serve our friends and neighbours who are in need. We especially pray for our food bank here today at St Thomas's Church and for the committee who are being established to look after that and to organise it. In a moment of quiet, we pray too for any other aspect of life in our local community that's on our mind today. Loving God, we ask for your healing touch on all who are ill or who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. And in a moment of quiet, we name someone, perhaps ourselves, who we know that needs God's help today. Merciful God, give courage and faith to all those who have been bereaved, either recently or at this time of year. And we pray that by sharing their concerns and grief with you, that they might find strength to face the future. God, send us out into the world, we pray, renewed by our worship and renewed by a strength of our fellowship, so that we can be a witness to your Son, Jesus Christ, and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we make these prayers. Amen. <clears throat> so we come now to a time of Holy Communion. Um, if you're new among us or this is your first time here, um, anybody is welcome to come forward to receive communion at this church. There's both bread and wine. If you'd like to receive just bread, please make that clear. It's gluten-free bread, and there's also wine available for those who would take it. The Lord is here. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God and Everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son. For in these 40 days, you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline, we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer, and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy words, you open our hearts to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendor of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we obey his commands, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured might be for us the body and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes again in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for when that day comes, when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen clearly in all the earth. Look with favor on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with Thomas and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, for we all share in one bread. And so draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this, your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen.
the body of Christ. The blood of Christ. Ray, please could you put on the next slide? Thank you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith, with thanksgiving. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord
So, Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. God, in these days of Lent, as we remember your final days, your journey to Jerusalem, and your final week, all the events around that, God, we pray that we would be struck afresh by the wonder of your love for us, that through that we might be transformed. God, we thank you that we are welcome here that we can celebrate your goodness towards us in body and blood, in bread and wine. As we leave this place, God, we pray that our lives might, be, might just be remade. All that's wrong with them might be put back together. And Lord, that we might live always and only for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're almost at the end of our service. I just want to bring a couple of announcements uh, to you just before we sing our final song, which Chris and Grace and Aileen are going to lead us in. Um, we've got our Lent course starting on Tuesday at two o'clock over in the hall. Uh, don't miss that. That's looking at Jesus' last words um, in, in Holy Week. We've got our Alpha course beginning on Monday 6th of March. An Alpha course is for people with questions about life, faith and meaning. And it's here in church starting at 7 o'clock on Monday 6th. Starts with a meal together and then there's a video looking at some topic of faith and then time to just discuss together what we think that means. So that's Alpha starting Monday 6th of March. Brilliant to invite someone along to it if you can. Next one is um, King Charles III's coronation is on Saturday 6th of May with a bank holiday on Monday 8th of May. And I'd just love some ideas from you, if you've got any, on how best we might mark that as a church. Is there anything you'd love to see happen? Is there anything that you think is a good idea? Let me know. I'm all ears. Um, we've got an electoral roll review going on at the moment for the next two weeks. If you don't know what the electoral roll is, it's, a, it's just a list of all the people in our parish who want to be uh, on the electoral roll of this church so it's, it's sort of your name and your address and your phone number and those kinds of bits of information. Um, it's being reviewed uh, and we've got forms at the back. If you're not on it and you'd like to be on our electoral roll, please let me know. Um, there's tea and coffee available after the service for the adults and uh, dinner provided for all the little ones. Please do join us over in the hall. And um, that is all my notices for tonight, so can I invite uh, our, our, our mini band up and we're going to stand and sing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace. Please stand.
So hope to see you over in the hall for some food and drinks just now. Um, one of the members of our congregation shared this blessing with me the other day, and I thought it was so lovely, I wanted to share it with you today too. As we go from this place, may God's love be a bridge to you, and may that bridge shine with peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. <laughs>